Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. My guest this week is Alex Grant, co-founder and CEO of Magrathia Metals. Magrathia is developing a new process for the production of magnesium. And for disclosure, the major supporter of Cleaning Up, Capricorn Investment Group, led their seed round last year, and I am a modest investor. Please welcome Alex Grant to Cleaning Up. Before we start, if you're enjoying Cleaning Up, please make sure that you like, subscribe, and leave a review. That really helps other people to find us. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform, and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram to participate in the discussion. Also, you can visit cleaningup.live to access over 160 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders. And you can subscribe there to our free newsletter. That's cleaningup.live. Cleaningup.live. And if you particularly enjoy an episode, please spread the word, tell your friends and colleagues about it. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation. So, Alex, thank you so much for joining us here on Cleaning Up. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. So now I've done my little preamble, and the viewers and listeners will already know that you have a company called Magrathia, mm -hmm. and that I'm a very small investor, and you're doing magnesium, but in your own words, tell us what you're doing. We're, uh, we're developing a new generation of electrolytic technology for making magnesium metal, <clears throat> which is a very light structural metal from seawater and brines. So it's a way to make carbon neutral primary light metal without any mining in the supply chain of the structural metal. So give us a primer on magnesium. Why is magnesium cool? So um, magnesium is pretty neat, uh, being the lightest structural metal. So it's about a third lighter than aluminum and three to five times lighter than steel. Um, it can be made from aqueous resources, which you can basically never do with aluminum and iron, which is quite unique. Um, and it actually has been for almost a century or more than a century. Um, it's very easy to die cast. So in a world where, you know, Tesla and other automakers have adopted very, very large die casting machines for making auto parts and consolidating auto parts into one, one big, one big part, uh, magnesium has a really kind of inherent advantage uh, to be introduced more in manufacturing and transport for ultra lightweighting. So what sort of components are we going to make from magnesium? And what, what can we, what are the uses? So historically, mag's been used all around cars. Um, so there's serial production pieces for, for roofs, doors, um, uh, kind of center consoles, dashboards, uh, kind of almost every part you can imagine. Um, so in principle, it is possible to use mag for eliminating dead weight in all of those applications. Um, there's people working on using mag uh, kind of in conjunction with aluminum to make ultra lightweight enclosures for, for battery packs and EVs. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it, it's actually really quite versatile. I'm sure when I was at school, we got like magnesium filings and they kind of burnt, mm. uh, but you can do things like that, that, that apparently is only because they were filings. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, when you grind up any metal, wh whether it be iron or aluminum or, or mag, um, it will light on fire as a powder <laughs> with very high surface area to volume ratio. Right. Um, magnesium also has a relatively high vapor pressure when it's molten. So <clears throat> if molten mag is exposed to air, it can have kind of thermal properties. But um, in, you know, in common use cases like big chunky metal parts or in an ingot like these guys that we made from seawater, this is virtually impossible to light on fire. Um, and part of the reason why is because it has a very high thermal conductivity. So it whisks away heat very quickly and it won't melt. So it basically so you, it's very can you make, to light. Can you make things like um, engine blocks from it? I mean, so the really big heavy pieces in a, in a vehicle? Mm -hmm. So yeah, Volkswagen actually made the, uh, the Beetle engine block out of mag for decades. I thought so, I thought so. So these are, these are your, your ingots, and I, I love it because it's like branded. As, a, mm. as an investor, I'm enormously proud mm -hmm. of this. And, uh, and yeah, it is, it's light. And um, so you say it's one third the weight of, um, of aluminum. Mm -hmm. We interrupt this show for a short service announcement. A few times during this conversation, I refer to magnesium as being three times lighter than aluminum, or aluminum, if you prefer. That is, of course, not correct, as I'm sure all of you will have noticed. Magnesium is one-third lighter than aluminium or aluminum, 
not three times lighter. Sorry about that. And of course, if you're enjoying these conversations, make sure you like, subscribe, and leave a review. And of course, tell all your friends about cleaning up. That really helps us to be discovered. And now, back to the show. And now, your process, is that going to become as cheap as aluminium or more expensive? And where, where, are, you, where are you trying to get it to? So, um, so, so when you have a cost structure that's dependent on more or less seawater and electricity, and if you believe in a future of renewable energy abundance from solar and wind principally, or you know, advanced geothermal systems perhaps, um, then you can believe in a future of cheaper electrolytic products in general. And MAG really falls into this boat in a big way. Um, we, we believe we can make magnesium metal with a, with a cash cost that would make it competitive with aluminum. Um, you know, if you look back decades through the literature on, on magnesium, you'll find over and over and over a reference to the magnesium to aluminum price ratio. So <clears throat> the price of aluminum or mag are, are rarely discussed, uh, sort of, in, you know, on, on their own, but as a ratio. And, um, that's sort of an expression of their fungibility. Uh, multiple times over the last couple of decades, parts have gone from aluminum to mag and vice versa for different reasons. When you talk about that price ratio, is that per kilo? Because, per kilo, yeah. But then you need you need one third of the kilos of magnesium, or is it is it weaker than aluminum? I mean, what? Well, yeah. You know, when you replace yeah. a part, an aluminum part, and I keep I'm going to say alum, aluminium because I'm British. Yeah. Um, but uh, so when you place a, replace an aluminium part with a magnesium part, do you have to make it thicker or heavier or, or not heavier? But do you, what, what, how, how does that play out? It, it depends on the part and you know what kind of load it's going to take and what direction and all these different things that design engineers know a lot about. But um, you know, I think I think maybe what kind of answers your question is like at what price ratio did things start to flip? Right, right? absolutely. Yeah. And um, and that that ratio is usually between like one point one and one point three. So okay. because you are buying fewer kilos, uh, you know, people in principle are willing to pay slightly more. Um, uh, per kilo, essentially. So. And, and other than automotive, presumably it's anything that's mobile, the aeroplanes, anything, anything you need a light structural metal, or, yeah. or am I, is that underselling it? Yeah, I know. So, so Dow used to market mag as the metal of motion. So anywhere where you have to lift something or move something, you know, light weighting and especially magnesium has a big role to play. Um, so there's magnesium in like every single helicopter, every single plane. I've, I got a picture, one of our, one of our partners actually, uh, pours the, um, the, the, the door hinges for Boeing. And I actually have a picture of, of me holding one with my pinky. Um, so it's in, you know, every commercial, you know, airplane part, every, every commercial airplane you can imagine. Um, and every single car too. Now, when you and I first met, you were Mr. Lithium. Mm -hmm. I sort of saw you as the expert and I was, was asking questions. In fact, everybody was asking questions about, you know, can we scale up lithium production? And you were Mr. Lithium and you, I think- I don't Big know, Lithium. You were Big Lithium. That was your kind of <laughs> nickname, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Your handle. Yeah. Um, and then suddenly you came to me and you said, Michael, I'm going, in, I'm not going to be a consultant. I'm going to go into business. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start this business. And I was like, ooh, lithium, here we come. And you said magnesium. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, where did that come from? So, um, so yeah, I was consulting in, uh, in lithium for about four years, <clears throat> started my own consulting company, helping people understand, you know, what types of process technologies we needed for producing lithium chemicals for batteries from all different types of unconventional natural resources. And, um, you know, I had industrial conglomerates on multiple continents hire me to help put, kind of advise on these topics. And, uh, multiple times, I was actually called out to the Western U.S., to Utah, and different places to uh, help take lithium out of magnesium chloride brines. So I was sort of accidentally learning about the resource base for for magnesium when I was working in lithium. And there's a whole bunch of like you know salt chemistry reasons why you know they kind of end up so together. Because magnesium is a problem in the brines we use for lithium. Magnesium is a problem, right? Yeah, it's an impurity that gets in the way sometimes. Right. So the number one reason why the Salar de Uni in Bolivia is so challenging to develop for lithium is because there's too much mag. Uh, so um, uh, yeah, and this is this is in almost every lithium deposit. Mag is a is an impurity you have to remove. So I was learning all that chemistry. And, and your background you know. is chemeng, so this is not difficult for you to learn about, right? Yeah, I have a undergrad from right. McGill in Montreal in chemical engineering, and um, was in a PhD in chemi. Uh, at Northwestern and Chicago uh, that I left with a master's. Um, so yeah, deep technical background and, uh, you know, spent six, seven years in, in brine chemistry and, and process technology for, for natural resources. 
Um, so, so yeah, that was the kind of experience that, that I that I was able to. Okay, so yeah. there's a there's a light bulb sort of going flickering about magnesium. Hmm, you know, the, learning about it, and then you. What happened first? Did you did you then meet your co-founder Jacob, or did you? decide to go for magnesium and then he turned up. He, uh, yeah, he really disrupted my beautiful, beautiful life I had. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so Jacob uh, moved, uh, moved to San Francisco about four years ago to work for Tesla. Before that, he, was, he did his PhD at Cambridge in chemical engineering and uh, was from Australia. So we're, we're both from, we're from Canada and Australia respectively, not even American. And uh, his first job was at Alcoa in Perth making alumina for, to make aluminum. And um, the result of that job was him thinking about light metal. Aluminium. Aluminium. Not aluminum. Uh, yeah, so, do we have to... You can say it the way you want. I'm just, sorry, I'm interrupting you. No, ja yeah. Jacob and I have many, many jokes about this. So right. um, anyways, um, so no, he was thinking about light metal for a very long time and, and thought that, uh, you know, aluminium had a big <laughs> role to play in, in electrification because it was so light. And about 30% of the cost of making aluminum is actually electricity and smelting. Um, and being Australian, he's kind of a solar energy maximalist. So, uh, so thought that, you know, perhaps the price of aluminum would kind of come down as the price of electricity specifically came down. But then someone who was, I think, a former hatch engineer at Tesla working on the cathode pilot with, with Jacob mentioned, uh, you know, what about mag, right? It's kind of like aluminum's little brother, you know, every aluminum alloy has magnesium in it. Every magnesium alloy has aluminum in it, you know, and, um, and, they, and they have very similar properties, almost the exact same melting point, et cetera. And, um, and, and he had not thought about mag before, but, um, you know, it turned out that, you know, 70% of the cost of making magnesium metal was electricity instead of 30. So it was, it was much more congealed electricity than aluminum is, you know, it gets called that all the time. But um, most of the cost of making aluminum is actually making the alumina to get smelted into aluminum which is all, you know, bauxite mining and the Bayer process and very reagent and energy intense. So, um, so anyways, we were just hanging out on a Saturday in San Francisco and he brought up magnesium as an opportunity for ultra lightweighting, for decarbonization. You know, we started thinking about how, because no CO2 is directly emitted in electrolysis of magnesium chloride for making magnesium metal, perhaps it could be decarbonized more easily. And we still, and now we have a lot of information to suggest that's true. So, um, you know, while aluminum is extraordinarily hard to decarbonize, if not impossible. So basically, um, he just kind of pulled me down the rabbit hole. And, uh, you know, I knew nothing about magnesium metal at the time. Um, you know, if you would have asked me, I, I would have thought that if you threw it in a lake, it would explode like sodium metal or lithium metal or potassium metal um, or even calcium metal. But, um, but it's kind of a quirk of the periodic table that magnesium and aluminum are actually kind of right beside each other if you remove the transition elements. Um, so its properties are way more similar to aluminum than it is like anything else. And, you know, if you put it in water, it certainly doesn't explode. It looks like aluminum. Aluminium. It looks like a, a, aluminum. You can, you know, you can lick it if, if one would ever want to. Um, it won't harm you, right? Like um, the, the center of the chlorophyll molecule in plants is a magnesium ion. So it's like super, you know, biocompatible and... Um, what about um, electrical performance? Because uh, the, there's this big thing going on with mm, copper is really, really difficult in terms of the volumes that we're going to need to electrify everything or nearly everything. Um, but then you've got aluminium, which is a substitute for copper in some electrical use cases, many electrical use cases. Could we go all the way to magnesium or not? Potentially, if the if the if the price was low enough, um, you know, electrical conductivity to some extent is uh, a function of kind of the density of of, of atoms in a, in a in a cross section, right? Um, but because magnesium is so light, uh, it basically means you know you need a. So you would need if you're doing a cable out of magnesium, it would start to get pretty big. It would it potentially get bulky. I mean, we could we could probably do the calculation, you know, but. Uh, but, okay. uh, but no, in principle, it's possible. So it's, but for structural use, so it sounds like the substitutions, the really big substitutions, it could be quite interesting, is kind of aluminium goes into copper, but magnesium goes into aluminium. So it starts to displace aluminium in automotive and, and aviation and a whole bunch of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, you know, magnesium is fundamentally like not a resource problem. That's something really interesting about it. You can make it from seawater and it's been made from seawater commercially for decades, multiple times. So... You know, as the world faces all these different crises with, with resources in the in the supply chain of of, uh, of uh, electri electrified technology, like 
you know, MAG has a big role to play, you know, we think for kind of reducing some pressure on their supply chains. And are you going straight for seawater or you, um, I mean, because we were sort of prepping for this and, and I came up with this little expression, which I hope you're going to steal, called mi- from mining to brining. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so you're doing this through brines, but are they, are you looking primarily for sort of salts or really going straight to seawater? So um, the, the really hard part of making magnesium metal isn't really like the upstream hydrometallurgy. So these ingots here are actually made from seawater. Um, so this is the first electrolytic metal made from seawater in, in almost 20 years. Um, so it's possible. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at a whole bunch of different resource opportunities, like different wastes from all different types of operations. Um, you know, when you remove magnesium from molten aluminum to make aluminum foil, it's very ductile. It's because the mag has been removed because it stiffens aluminum. Um, that makes a magnesium chloride waste. Um, you know, making titanium, hafnium, zirconium, that makes so magnesium chloride waste. Are there piles of these wastes sort of, that have been extracted? Because it's kind of, because it's been a problem in titanium, in aluminium. So does that mean that, you know, as you sort of scour the countryside, do you find piles of this stuff sort of shunted off into tailings down? <clears throat> yeah, coming, coming from my, my lithium brine, you know, experience that I, I did learn where a lot of magnesium chloride oh. is uh, in different forms. Um, so that gives us like kind of almost like an unfair advantage for like, you know, understanding the resource base for magnesium metal that like very few people have. Um, but you know, to answer your question at a very high level without giving away any spicy trade secrets, like, yeah, there's a lot of magnesium chloride out there. Um, so we will make metal from seawater. We have made metal from seawater. Um, but it's just one possibility for making metal. Now, talk me through the normal process for making magnesium okay so it's this fantastic metal it's three times as light as as aluminium and um so you can use it in all sorts of ways and it will reduce it's it, it, it's both you could make it zero carbon but it'll also reduce the energy because if it's lighter then a car would you know drive further and all those sorts of good things so it's fantastic so why are we not using loads and loads of it already? What, what's the big issue and how is it, is it to do with how it's made now? Mm-hmm. So, um, so cumulatively, over the first hundred years of the industry from maybe 1910 or 1900, the majority of magnesium metal ever made was made electrolytically from seawater by people like North Kydro and Dow. Um, so that is actually like the normal technology for making magnesium metal. And this is like industrial history that like, everyone has kind of forgotten that we've, we've started retelling that story of how compelling that is for the era we live in now. Um, about 30 years ago, the Chinese started, you know, essentially taking over the industrial base of the West in many different ways, not just mag, but aluminum, even steel, lithium, everything, right? And um, they tapped into a different cost structure than seawater and electricity. Uh, it was a process called the pigeon process, um, which basically takes in inputs of more or less coal and labor. So in the 90s and early 2000s, China had a lot of very low cost coal and labor. Um, Both of those things are becoming and have become more expensive in China in the last couple of years. Um, So it's it's become a less competitive uh, process on a cost basis. But in the 90s, they were able to essentially dump like they did to many other industries into Western markets. And their raw material is magnesium carbonate. So it's not the same raw material. It's not these brines or salts or anything. Exactly, completely different. So you'll take like a, like a dolomite, magnesium carbonate, calcium carbonate, or, or, or pure magnesite, and react it at over a thousand degrees Celsius with, with ferrosilicon, which is itself the whole, you know, coal derived product. Um, so you're heating it up. Why with ferrosilicon? You're trying to get the oxygen out of the, no, you're trying to get, yes. You're reducing the magnesium to from two plus to zero to, right. to, to, to metal. Um, and you're making a vapor phase magnesium metal, which then gets condensed in a vacuum. Um, and then a guy goes in with a shovel and like chips it out. So it's a crazy process. And like, it would never be economic if you didn't have essentially free heat from coal processing. What is the life expectancy of the guy with the shovel who chips it I, out? I can't imagine very high. <laughs> um, you know, we have pictures from some of these plants. I mean, it's like something out of, you know, uh, industrial revolution, you know, Britain. Because, you know, we shouldn't be flippant um, about the human cost of, you know, China has dominated sector after sector. And one of the ways they've done it is through environmental dumping. So they have, uh, it wasn't just that it's a, uh, an environmentally, a, a carbon intensive process at 1100, 1300 C, uh, and that labor was cheap. They were actually, you know, they were actually uh, 
there was a human cost. People were dying because of the way that they're doing this, right? Um, yeah, and, and the advantages that made that possible in the 90s and 2000s are going away. So in China, they're actually trying to commission an electrolytic magnesium metal plant to sort of you know, be able to shut down some of that really nasty labor-intense production. Um, so already in China, that's the direction they're going. But, but does that mean, I mean, is the story here, you know, China was environmentally and humanly dumping mm -hmm. and that's stopping and now magnesium is going to become more expensive. Mm -hmm. Is that the story here? Um, I, I don't think that it necessarily has to become more expensive. Um, you know, if you can own a cost structure that's mostly dependent on seawater and electricity, and if you believe in a future of renewable energy abundance and low cost power, then it's relatively easy to believe in a future of low cost magnesium metal. So, you know, what we've done over the last year to 18 months is go back and survey every attempt ever at electrolytic magnesium metal from brines and seawater and, um, you know, try to avoid the mistakes that other people have made to radically reduce the cost of, of, of that metal and you know, develop a new generation of technology that solves legacy cost issues. So, um, so yeah, going forward, uh, you know, we, we think we can be really competitive with Chinese pigeon process. Um, but, you know, meanwhile, you know, the Western market and the Chinese market are kind of quite different too. So the price of mag in the U.S. right now is, you know, structurally two to three times higher because of an anti-dumping duty, which protects the one primary metal producer in the entire Western world. Um, and ex-China producers typically can, can charge like 2x because you know, the, the defense complex in the U.S. doesn't want to have to depend on Chinese metal. Because um, so, you will remember when we first spoke about me investing in Magrathea, and you sort of said, well, you know, uh, yeah, it's more expensive, but it'll be fine because people won't buy the cheap Chinese stuff. They'll buy this more expensive so, and I said, mm, I don't know how that works because it kind of sounds good in theory. And right now, you know, people want to de-risk and they don't want to buy chains. But, you know, are people really going to continue to pay twice as much yeah. um, for, a, for a metal, uh, that, uh, you know, as they have to? Or, 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 you know, is that still part of your kind of business plan? I need to know this as an yeah. investor. Is it still part of your business plan to kind of only sell to people who will overpay for the uh, resource? Yeah, no, that's, that's the thing. After we really dug in, you know, and worked on it for a year, we realized, wait, you know, if, if we can really own this cost structure enabled by ownership of technology, um, you know, we don't need a premium. We don't need a green premium. We don't need a red, white, and blue premium. Um, we, we will likely be cost competitive with Chinese pigeon process. Um, so that is really, not, very, really very much not part of the calculus at all anymore. Um, and uh, we think that's what you really need if you're going to be competitive with aluminum in the long term. I, I agree, which is why, you know, when you first said, oh, it's okay, it'll be more expensive, but it'll be fine. And, and that, so what you're saying is, no, you've actually um, sharpened the pencil, come back. And presumably it's things like you've got a continuous process, very cheap electricity, you found some good resources, those sorts of things. Well, also being able to use intermittent energy in a, in a kind of engineered way, right? So with aluminum smelting, for example, it's basically impossible to, you know, use a variable energy input because of the chemistry of, of molten cryolite and alumina dissolution. And like, if you change a composition or temperature, everything freezes or you start having big problems in your smelting process. But in our process, because the temperature is way lower, and because of just the inherent chemistry of the electrolyte. There are people who disagree with that. Sorry to cut in, but, you know, I, I think I put you in touch with Enna Pot, and then there's, uh, there's a few people uh, actually looking at using aluminium uh, smelting as a way of providing demand response and load following, but uh, you're, not, uh, you're not convinced, or you think you can do it easier? No, anyway? I, I, really, I really like them, and uh, I, I really hope they're successful, but that's like a plus or minus 10% thing. Like we're we're pursuing like a plus or minus like fifty percent thing, okay. Um, which could allow you to like you know shut down for fifteen percent of the day. With aluminum smelters, you only have like five to ten de degrees of superheat above the liquidus. So you know if the temperature drops in your cell by ten degrees Celsius, everything freezes. Um, in our process, we have like a hundred degrees of superheat. So you can imagine a world where if you have you know twenty dollar per megawatt hour power for seventy percent of the day then you could, you know, I'm not proposing this is exactly what we would do. There's a minute, bunch of different ways we could do it, but like you could shut down for 20% of the day, like cut out the part of the day where the price of electricity is high um, and then go back to making metal when it's cheap again. So, um, so you can never do that with aluminum, even with NPOTS technology. Um, but again, I really like NPOTS, so. <laughs>
But what are you doing that's particularly clever, right? Because um, you started by saying that historically all magnesium was made this way, mm -hmm. right? And there's, uh, there, there was, uh, in Norway there was a plant, there was one in Canada, Beconcourt, and, and they all got shut down. They all got outcompeted by the Chinese. Can't those people just kind of reactivate and have the same economies of scale or a bit of flexibility that you're doing? What, what's the clever here? We've developed a completely different way of processing the magnesium chloride salt before it gets melted and electrolyzed. So that's actually the hard part of electrolytic magnesium metal. It's kind of bizarre. Not very many people know about this chemistry, but if you try to make anhydrous magnesium chloride with just like heat and vacuum, um, you won't make anhydrous magnesium chloride. You'll actually make magnesium oxide, which is inert because of a hydrolysis reaction. So you're trying to dry this thing and if you heat it too much, then it oxidizes and you're kind of- If, right. if you heat it in the wrong way, right. <clears throat> it okay. basically you know, gets converted to make so oxide. Um, See, I'm doing due diligence that I didn't do when I invested. <laughs> I, so there is something clever and some patents and all our, that sort well, of stuff. Well, our sponsors, the Capricorn Investment Group, did the diligence. Um, but, um, but no, we've developed a much simpler, more robust, low capex intensity way of doing that final drying step. That's really the hard part. And Norsk Hydro at Beckencore and Porsgrunn in Norway um, used to be able to make really nice, low water content, low oxide content my chloride, really anhydrous, great for electrolysis into metal, but the process used was extraordinarily expensive and extraordinarily capex intense. It's a hydrochloric acid drying process. So, you know, you can only imagine hydrochloric acid gas, not aqueous hydrochloric acid gas is like one of the most corrosive things you can imagine. So, you know, if you hire an engineering company to build that for you, they're just going to like make everything out of titanium, right? Because, uh, you know, they want to be able to put a warranty on it or, you know, guarantee that it's going to work and uh, um, not suffer the embarrassments of it corroding, right? So, um, so the CapEx just goes to the moon. And, you know, I have almost like an ideological view that if you're going to compete with, with China, you need to unlock totally different cost structures on both OPEX and CapEx um, to, to reduce, you know, CapEx, things like CapEx intensity or else it's just not going to work because um, raising money to, to finance these projects is not, you know, just a walk in the park. So, um, so that's been like, a, you know, a big kind of um, guiding, you know, thought process for us is like, how do we kill CapEx intensity? especially um, to be able to take advantage of that low cost energy. So this um, sort of process of mining to brining, of going from you know, lots of crushing rocks and then heating them up to very high temperatures and so on, yours is not the only product. I and mean, this is not the only uh, process where this is being sort of you know, attempted or tried. So is this part of a kind of mega trend? Can one say mining to brining is like a yeah. really big deal that will help us to get to net zero? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of a brine maximalist, right? Like, I think there's a lot of interesting things we can make from brines, like metal. Um, you know, I worked on a whole bunch of different lithium brine projects over the years before I was working on that. Because this is the, in lithium, this is called direct lithium extraction, DLE type processes. Is that right? Yeah. So, you know, my, my kind of like uh, most popular consulting product that I had before I was working on MAG was, was a DLE technology review report. Um, and uh, I supplied that research product to like, you know, lots of people who we can't name, um, who are making huge investment decisions off the back of it. Um, so I, I went really, really deep on, on brine process technology for lithium. And in the process, I realized like, wait, we're actually making a lot of things from brine already. You know, bromine uh, is made from brine in places like Arkansas. Um, calcium chloride is made from brine. Um, sodium chloride salt, is, of course, is made from seawater, sea salt, right? Um, and... Um, and yeah, I just found it utterly like, I mean, tantalizing and beautiful that we can make structural metal from brine too. I mean, that's just kind of, um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people think we're doing science fiction stuff, but. <laughs> but but is, does it go beyond just brines? Because the brine is kind of connected with the extraction, but just in general, going from thermal chemistry to electrochemistry. Uh, and I, because I, I see a lot of these kind of. Um, I see that theme popping up in things like um, Harbour Bosch process. Couldn't we do that differently? Or fixing CO2. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of doing um, sort of direct air capture using amines, you would use uh, an electrolytic process. Well, is, is, that, is any of that going to work? Or is this kind of like just, just extracting money from, from venture <laughs> and private equity players? Well, I think um, in, in, in all like frontier technology spaces, um, you know, I mean, it's a portfolio, right? Like 80 to 90 percent of projects will fail. Of course, that's always true. Um, I, I think that the theme of electrification of industry is, is really powerful and, uh, and legitimate. Um, there's already lots of electrochemical processes that are, 
that have been running at full scale for decades, right? Like chloralkali for making caustic and, and HDL. Um, Smelting aluminum. Aluminum yeah. um, and, and others. So, um, so it's not a new idea at all. Um, I, I, I'm not like necessarily an electrochemistry maximalist the way that like Jacob might be. <laughs> Your co-founder. Our right, co-founder, yeah, our CTO. Um, but, um, you know, because I, I think that there's, you know, probably ways to make clean things that don't necessarily depend on direct electrification. Um, but um, but in this case, it, it's kind of like almost obvious that electrolytic processes is superior. So, okay, what about so obviously uh, you know you said seventy eighty percent of projects fail. Hopefully, obviously not Magrathia in this process. But, I don't think it will. Um, yeah, I mean, um, obviously well, not. Having raised uh, a chunk of money and okay. devoted your career and your co-founder's mm-hmm. career to it, what about though? There's a really interesting one which is um, uh, steel. So you've got. A lot of momentum, there's a lot of wind in the sails of hydrogen reduction for steel, but there are other people who want to do it electrolytically. So there's, uh, there's Boston Metal, there's um, Fortescue Future Industries, actually a lot of people um, looking at electrolytic steel. If you had to bet with your you know, electrochemistry and uh, chem eng hat on, what would you say, uh, hydrogen wins or electrochemistry wins? Oh man, I mean, um, I mean, hydrogen uh, is electrochemistry in the green hydrogen, you know, vision. Yes, but um, it's electro, but it's producing it's the green hydrogen and then indirect. using it yeah. for chemical reduction. Um, I, I mean, direct electrical reduction. Yeah, direct, directly direct. electrify yeah. Uh, yeah. Iron reduction. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think potentially, potentially both could be successful. I um, I don't really see why I don't really see a reason why both would be successful if if energy is really that cheap. Um, you know, capex could kill directly electrified steel making um, if you need like billion dollar anodes. <laughs> um, but uh, but I I don't. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really severely biased against that. The challenge there is the anode. It's a very high temperature, isn't it? It's like 14, 1500 degrees and it likes to melt. Everything likes to melt at that point, no? So, so yeah. So, so Boston Metal, for example, uh, in, you know, I think the nature paper that is, was kind of like the, the foundation of Boston Metal was, I think, in 2012 or 2014. Um, it, was, it was on essentially inert anodes, like non-carbon anodes for, um, for reduction of, of iron oxide to iron. And... Um, uh, you know, non-carbon anodes in aluminum smelting uh, is is almost like this, uh, this this kind of unicorn technology that people have pursued for decades. Mm. Um, you know, there's history going back 50, 60 years even on, on non-carbon anodes. Um, but aluminum smelting, you know, we're talking like kind of 950 to 1000 C. Um, with iron, you have to get above the melting point of iron and whatever electrolyte you're using. So, so yeah, you're a couple hundred degrees Celsius, even higher than that. What temperature are you going to be at? We're at like less than 700 C. So it's like preposterously lower temperature than than even aluminum smelting, um, and uh, and the chemistry is much more favorable. So like molten fluorides that you have in an electrolyte for aluminum smelting are really nasty. Like cryolite, you know, the, the salt that is the you know main component of, of the electrolyte is uh, it's often called the universal solvent. Um, and if it leaks, then you know people have said like it'll it'll just like corrode its way to the center of the earth. <laughs> you know, um, of course it freezes, but like um, but it, it, it's terribly corrosive. So. Those, you know, those challenges, um, I, I can imagine, can only be almost worst with iron. It, it feels like you're sitting here and sort of saying, well, you know, whatever it is, uh, 18 months, two years into this uh, Magrathia journey, you you still haven't seen any showstoppers and uh, you're still, you know, you seem very bullish. At least, you know, that's the impression you give. W- what keeps you up at night? What's What are the things that you really think, okay, if it's going to fail, yeah. it's going to fail because of X. What is X? So, um just just to like kind of riff on what you just said though like the the purpose of that angel round that you passed on a a year and a half ago was to figure out like is this a good idea and should we work on it right and we had some very nice california types uh you know yolo some money in at a very low valuation right but the purpose of the seed round was was for us to you know come back and basically be like oh my goodness like we think we've discovered something really significant here and in also you know inventing a new process for the dehydration of chloride um, so our, our conviction in, in what we're doing and the future of, of mag and lightweighting is, is basically only grown and solidified. Um, I'm, I'm in a very lucky position right now in like late 2023 to be, you know, kind of almost extraordinarily well capitalized. We brought on some of the best investors in the world in our seed round. 
it was um, perhaps almost too big of a seed round. <laughs> it was more money than we were even going after. Um, so I feel very, very lucky and very blessed to have that. Um, we've been able to recruit an incredible team. I mean, we have like, you know, in software, they call them 10X engineers. You know, we're doing chemical engineering, so it's, it's different. But like, I legitimately think we have people doing the jobs of like five. Um, so that's going extraordinary. Um, you know, if you would have asked me six year, six months ago, I would have said recruiting was like the biggest thing I was afraid of, but we've kind of solved that problem. Um, you know, right now we're just, uh, we're just kind of heads down focused on executing and delivering the things that we said we would do, uh, out of the seed round fundraise, um, which is delivering a two ton per year pilot. So the entire team right now in California is completely focused on that. Um, two, two ton per year. So, um, what percentage of everything you've made does this represent? We've made about uh, about two kilos in late 2022. And this, I'm guessing, is about two, three hundred grams. It's about fifty grams. Fifty grams. Is it 50 grams? It's about seventy-five. Yeah. Seventy-five. Okay, yeah. so there you go. There's my so, my internal scales are way off, but uh, but it's it's uh, so you've gone up uh, fifty to five hundred. You you you've gone up two orders of magnitude about from yeah. one of these, right? Yeah. Um, but you need to do two tons a year, you said? So that's a big that's, step, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a big step, but it's still kind of like human scale. Like you can have like a guy like move equipment. So it, we're not at a point yet where like materials handling and things like that is unruly. You, you can still have like PhDs doing things like uh, grinding and put, filling things and moving them around. Right? Kinda, yeah, yeah. We're, st we're just at the cusp of being able to not do that anymore. Because right. the thing is when you're developing chemical process technology, right? Like the thing that the PhD always like kind of runs into and thinks it's like a fake problem, but it's actually like sometimes the problem is things like materials handling, you know? Like how do you just physically move? stuff around right so we're not at a scale yet where it causes problems um and and interestingly also like we only have kind of one scale up after this to commercial scale so when we deliver that pilot in the next couple months we only have one more scale up step to the demo plant where we're going to build a, com a couple commercial scale cells and that's only like a i think 40x scale up or something 40x so what what is the biggest chinese plant producing today in uh, annually in like 10 to maybe thirty thousand tons per year 10 to 30. So you've got to go from, from sort of this type of scale to two tons to 40 tons and then... Uh, two, like 100, 200 tons. Yeah. Sorry? To, 200 tons per year scale in the demo. In the demo. So you're going for... Yeah. So then it's, so it goes two, then 200 mm -hmm. you want to do. Okay. So that's quite... These are quite big jumps. All right. Divide so, by two though because it's right. two cells. So okay. Like, All right. All right. But, but orders of magnitude, when it's a couple... So you're going up sort of um, two orders of magnitude each, each step, right? Well, in, in this scale up step that we're that we're you know basically completing right now and commissioning the pilot, it's like yeah, it's like something like a hundred x. But the next one's about fifty. So and the rule of thumb is you never want to do like a thousand x. Like a hundred x is is okay. Um, you know, ten x with ten x you're not being ambitious enough to and some extent. So. When do you need to raise more money? Just we should also acknowledge that um, your big backer is also the major sponsor of this um, you know, of this podcast, this uh, video YouTube channel. I feel like um, we should like wave to Jan and Depender. We should wave to Jan and Depender. You know, we should look at the camera and say Hi hello and thanks and so on. But but realistically, I mean, they they are they are you know they've been fantastic supporters of what I do. Um, a fantastic supporters view and in fact i probably would have had you on the show kind of anyway because i think what you're doing is really really interesting um but when do you need to go out and get another round i mean what uh, in these kind of 100x 100x you've got like two or three of those still to do when do you need to go out and, yeah. and what quantum are you going to need to go out for so um so yeah we have one more scale up to do in that demo plan and then we're ready to develop commercial smelters but um uh there's um there's there's Things going on that I can't, I'm not allowed to announce yet, um, but in the next couple of weeks, uh, you know, perhaps even by the time that this goes online, um, it'll be public. Uh, we've we formed a partnership with a, uh, a, a significant government entity um, that's going to fund most of our scale up over the next couple of years. Um, so that's kind of deleted our Series A to some extent. Would that be a government agency that sort of procures this type of stuff, either directly or indirectly? I, I'm not allowed to say yet, so let's, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, but yeah, basically what it means is we don't, we're probably not really going to need to fundraise for like absolute minimum a year from now, like, you know, but probably not even, but two, three, four years, potentially, we, we might not really need to fundraise. You said something also about a 
car manufacturer. I'm not sure if you're allowed to reveal anything. Can you kind of can you can you tease us at least? I, I can definitely tease you, Michael. So um, you know we are doing an R and D project with uh, one of the world's largest automakers already. Um, after about you know six months post seed round. Um, yeah, I can't say very much about it or who it is or anything like that, but, um, but yeah, we've, you know, needless to say, we've had some pretty phenomenal traction so far with, you know, people who are interested in mag for die casting, for lightweighting, um, people who use magnesium to make other metals like hafnium and zirconium and titanium and all these other things, silicon even, um, and people who need mag for alloying and aluminum. Um, so, you know, people really want non-China low carbon magnesium metal. And a final question, because, you know, this is all about kind of leadership in the age of climate change. But this all sounds wonderful, and we'd kind of do it even if climate was not an issue, I think. Um, what is the potential impact on the climate challenge of this? I mean, is it fundamentally kind of, you know, is, is it a response to climate change? Or is it just sort of something that's a good thing and it's a, you know, it's a great metal? And, and, and in a way, there's a kind of corollary question, which is, is it actually going to help with climate change yeah. or is it going to just kind of enable us to do even faster cars and bigger aeroplanes and just, you know, does, does the Jevons effect just totally destroy your contribution to climate action? So, um, so, so aluminum is 2% of the world's CO2 emissions, right? Um, about a, a billion tons a year of CO2. Um, magnesium as a substitute for aluminum, you know, gives you a total adjustable decarbonization of like that order of magnitude. So tens, hundreds, of millions of tons of CO2. Um, that was why we like started the company, right? Because we just think magnesium is just fundamentally easier to decarbonize than aluminum. And you know, if decarbonization really does matter, um, you will see that price ratio evolve in a, in a favorable way towards mag. It's, it's, it's almost categorical. It's almost like not if, but when to some extent, because aluminum, primary aluminum is just so hard to decarbonize. Um, and you know, many of our investors you know, joined the company because they agree with that thesis. And um, I've now validated that position with some significant automakers, even other automakers who, besides the one we're doing an R&D project with that I also can't really talk about. But like, um, you know, that, that, that kind of perspective, I, I feel is pretty validated at this point. Um, but there's other reasons why we're building this company, right? So um, being able to eliminate mining from the supply chain of structural metal is like really motivating to me. You know, I've been... Uh, you know, trying to shut down the mines and, and ramp up the brines for, for, you know, more than half a decade now already. So I'm very passionate about that. Um, but, you know, the, the upstream supply chain of aluminum is, is horrible, right? We're mining primary Amazon rainforest for bauxite to make alumina. It's really awful. It's, it's one of the worst I can imagine for, for any material. So, um, so that's really motivating. But then, you know, in addition, which is like the big thing that kind of changed since you didn't invest in our angel round and then you did invest in our seed round, right, was... Um, it became very clear that we're kind of in this new decade of great power conflict and, you know, Pax Americana is over and, you know, supply chains are kind of deglobalizing and magnesium is like the poster child of an industry that was completely destroyed by China. So, um, you know, we have a lot of, you know, future customers approaching us being like, oh, my God, we're like completely dependent on China for all of this material. And, you know, 90 percent of our EBITDA is underpinned by supply of this metal. So, like. Um, you know, we need non-China sources desperately. Um, so that's like one of the biggest things that's changed in the last year. Look, I'm loving it. I've enjoyed the conversation. As an investor, I absolutely love it because as far as I can see, you've got lighter vehicles, which will use less fuel. You've got elimination of the uh, CO2 out of, uh, out of um, aluminium production as you substitute. You've got an improved and much more, uh, much healthier uh, supply chain, less mining, more brining, which is inherently better. And you're solving the world's geopolitical problems. So um, what can I say? You know, thank you for joining me. Thanks for letting me be an investor. Uh, and, uh, you know, go Magrathea, go Alex. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. So that was Alex Grant, CEO of Magrathea Metals. We'll include in the show notes a link to the press release on Magrathea's seed round earlier this year, as well as to a white paper written by Alex in Light Metal Age on the bright future for magnesium. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please remember to like, share and subscribe to Cleaning Up or leave us a review on your chosen podcast platform. And do please, please spread the word on social media or by telling your friends and colleagues.
And if you want more from Cleaning Up, sign up for our free newsletter at cleaningup.live where you'll find our archive of over 160 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation.